for those of you who've made it. Everybody else is sleeping in and watching the videos, I'm sure. So much excitement. I have, I should have, at the end of this class, right now I should have your homeworks. Hussein uh, graded them this weekend. Uh, and uh, I'll see if he shows up with them. If he doesn't have them, for whatever reason right now, I will not give them back to you this class because I won't have them. The, uh, I'll give you the feedback on that, and I will release the grades later today. I'm guessing that, I haven't actually seen the grades, sorry, but I'm, from what we talked about on the phone, Hussein and I, it sounds like everybody did pretty well. Uh, I hope, I would hope so, is what would be my comment. Uh, the, um, the, the question, I'm going to go over the questions quickly. Uh, talking about people who would oppose uh, an initiative to make it easier to, to ride bikes or make it harder to drive cars, most of the students said, that car companies and oil companies would oppose uh, the vehicle, um, uh, the, the, the loss of vehicle subsidies, let's call it. Awesome, thanks. See you. Um, and then, of course, uh, environmentalists and bike companies would be in favor of moving people from cars to bicycles. If you want to find out uh, why there might be more cars uh, in Canada or in the world compared to bicycles, I would suggest you look at the revenues for the oil industry and the car industry and compare it to the revenues for the bicycle industry. I would guess that it would be um, several orders of magnitude different. Um, a psychological way of affecting people's behavior was to uh, talk about health and air quality. That was, those are very good answers. These are the most common answers. Your answers may vary. Your answers were probably still okay. If, if they were wrong, they were wrong. I, uh, and, and I'm happy to talk to you about your answers with you. But if it push comes to shove, as you know, there's a written thing for asking for grading changes. But I'm happy to talk about how did this happen if, you're not, if you want to understand as opposed to wanting to grade change. If you actually subsequently want a grade change, that's also okay. Um, education and advertising uh, from celebrities were also very interesting ideas. Celebrity gets on his bike, rides down to Hollywood, makes a movie. You say, I don't need a Ferrari anymore. I can get on a bicycle like uh, uh, Angelina Jolie. So uh, how to move people in terms of uh, 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 taxes or subsidies. Carbon tax would reduce the use of cars. Uh, that's why they're so unpopular with car companies. And, uh, and by the way, what's the way to make a carbon tax unpopular with car companies, but reasonably popular with citizens? Yeah. Not exactly, no. That's a question of elasticities and, and what's called, uh, um, God, what's it called? There's an expression. The tax uh, burden is, is the ba tax burdens, remember, don't necessarily fall on the person who pays the tax. When you go to the store and you buy uh, whatever, uh, a coffee, and there's a tax on the coffee, the store is paying the tax, but you just bought the coffee. You, the incidence, the incidence of the tax is not the same as who pays the tax. This is very important in terms of politics, and you should know this in terms of economics. So um, if you're on the phone in the back of the room, are you still on the phone, or are you done? Okay. Or are you, actually, is that not a phone, and I'm wrong? Oh, I, okay, sorry, sorry. My bad. I saw the glowing, but it was your coffee. Okay, so uh, the incidence is not necessarily the same as who pays, right? And uh, I'll just answer the question for you. If you're going to collect a gasoline tax, a lot of people don't like that idea. Oh my God, I'm putting gas in my car. Instead, it's costing $30 or $50 for a fill-up. It's going to cost, say, $80. In the U.S., the price should literally double, right? And I'm going to lose all that money. Well, if the government takes that money and uses it to, to invade other countries or uh, gives it to uh, 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 political supporters, you might be very upset. But if the government actually refunds the money to citizens and says, every citizen here is going to get you know, uh, a piece of the, the tax revenue, then the political debate would change quite considerably. If you ride a bicycle, are you going to like this idea? Yes or no? Yes. Come on, this is like the call and answer here, right? If, you're, if you are a trucker and you drive for a living, are you going to like this policy? Yes or no? You can talk. It's OK. No, cycles will like it more. But if you're a trucker and, you just, and all the other truckers have higher costs also, who pays the tax? The truckers or the shippers or the customers? 
Who pays the tax? What is the question? What is the question? Is if there is a gasoline tax, a carbon tax, and the truckers are putting their pay, double their fuel cost in the tank, right? But all the shippers have to pay double the fuel cost. And there's the person who pays the tax, who is who? No. The, incident, the payment of the tax is the trucker. The incidence of the tax is the customer. So you guys are ahead of me, but that's correct, okay? So we have to keep those two things separate. Now, those truckers are all like, oh, no big deal. We don't have the incidence of the tax. Is that true or not? Who, what's going to happen that's going to disturb the truckers more than the incidence of the tax? What's going to happen? Less shipment by gasoline-powered conveyances, right? So trains might have, which have, they might be electric, but I think that, I don't know if they're in Canada, if they're diesel or not. So trains might have a comparative advantage, right? If you move, if the, if the cost of road shipment goes up, people might shift to trains, which maybe their fuel costs will go up a little bit, but most of the cost of, of a train is the capital cost. You have to pay millions for these things. So that's just some more comments that are not necessarily on your homework. All right. Um, Regulations, uh, there's a, there were a lot of uh, answers. This is the homework, by the way, for those of you who showed up late. And I have them, and I'll hand them out at the end of the entire class, OK? Uh, but one of the regulations that was suggested is, is the even plate, odd plate system, where, uh, which apparently is used in, in uh, China, Mexico City, and Iran, where if your car number plate ends in a, in a four, you can drive on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. If it ends in a and an odd number, like a one or three, then you can drive it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. There are some really funny people who go and buy two cars to get around this problem. Uh, most people can't afford two cars just to have a license plate. Uh, sometimes they forge the license plate. Uh, forgery is a very easy way to get around that. But on the other hand, uh, it's quite inconvenient, you know, if you're trying to drive every other day, and then what are you going to do? You're going to take a bus or a taxi, or you have, you have your, your car and your friend's car. So you're carpooling, that's good, but now there's still two cars. Right? And on the weekends, it's free driving, so then it's like a free-for-all. So that kind of regulation, of course, is, is quite uh, uh, difficult. It's not a price-based regime, so a price-based regime would be uh, auctioning uh, license plates, which I understand they do in some parts of China. Is that right? In Beijing or something like that? Yes? Apparently, if you have 88888, it's worth a lot of money, right? Like entire buildings for that license plate, right? The same thing happens in the UK where if you, if you buy a customs license plate and it's just like A1 or something like that sold for 100,000 pounds because somebody wanted to be like A1 steak sauce. Anyway, those are price mechanisms. Regulations, no, you can't drive that car on uh, odd days of the week because your license plate, that's one form of a regulation. Um, there's other ways to do it. The, um, you could say that no uh, lorries, no trucks are allowed to drive in the city between uh, say, 9 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening, right, to keep car, uh, trucks off the road. I would think that might be useful in parts of Vancouver, which are uh, more or less highways during some of the, of the driving hours. Um, now, one thing that, that he mentioned, which is important, which is important for this class, only, um, okay, students who got five were talking about the pros and cons of all methods. So if you, if you wrote more or you were, you, were, you were thorough, you were complete, you would get five points. Uh, almost no one talked about the political and financial feasibility of different techniques. So uh, that is something like, oh, let's have a carbon tax. Now, I just mentioned how difficult it is to get a carbon tax because of the auto industry. You should know that problem, right? You should know about who pays a tax versus the incidence. And on the other hand, uh, the, um, uh, the celebrity thing is actually quite a good idea. It's quite easy to do. And, and uh, Matt Damon uh, is really interested in water issues, and he is a very famous guy. And he went on, uh, he made an announcement saying, he had a press conference. I saw this. It was, on, uh, it was a fake press conference. But he said, I'm having a press conference today because I've decided to stop using the bathroom. I am not going to go to the toilet anymore because I am protesting people who don't have toilets, right? The washroom, so to speak. And that's Matt Damon. Probably 10 million people saw that. And then what do you do, right? You don't go to the bathroom also? I'm not sure if that's going to fix the problem, but uh, it was an idea of a celebrity who was maybe uh, 
wasting his time, wasting his celebrity. So uh, keep in mind that your ideas, the feasibility version of your ideas is what's going to come up in your blog posts and your briefings. And uh, speaking of which, um, I'm sure you'll be very excited to know, I will hand out homework two on Thursday as well as briefing number one on Thursday. Homework two is going to be due a week later and the briefing will be due, uh, briefing one will be, one will be due uh, not a week later but I think ten days later. I don't know the exact date but it's on the calendar. So you'll have a little while longer to do a briefing than you, than you have on a homework uh, but hopefully you'll have enough time to get it done. Now maybe you're on a computer, is that right? The guy next to you? Looking for what? The homework? Can you do that after class? Great, thanks. I, I have, on the first class, maybe you weren't here, I said please don't use your computers or phones during class because it distracts me when I, when I see you looking at the screen. Great? Okay, so Hayek. Who read Hayek? Who didn't read Hayek? Why didn't you read Hayek? You what? Didn't have time. Did you guys read Hayek? This weekend or next weekend? You you were hanging out, not reading Hayek. Okay. And the people who read Hayek, how long did it take you to read Hayek? Did you read it? Did it take how long did it take? Half an hour? Half an hour. Who did you guys read it? Huh? You read half of it. So fifteen minutes. Half of the what? Half of the paper. Okay. Did you read the other half of it? Okay, you didn't read it at all. That's quite appalling for the people who didn't read it, which appear to be three quarters of you, which means definitely there's going to be a midterm question on it. So now you know, right? That's a very good game. Don't do the work and then you'll get a question on it. And then you'll be at the bottom of the class and then your parents will be a bit mad at you because you've got a C. It's not that hard to spend half an hour, right? Besides the fact, I mean, how many classes are you taking? Let's not pick on you. Let's pick on you. How many classes are you taking? Four. four. Who's taking four classes here? Who's taking three classes here? Okay, three classers. You in the back of the hat. Did you read it? What happened to you? Challenging other classes. You had half an hour of work in four days. Somehow didn't get to it. 96 hours and half an hour was hard to slip in there. Don't be surprised if I'm rudely critical of your work. And I won't have any problem failing you either. It's not because you did or didn't do the reading, because when I judge your output, when I read your blog posts and I look at your briefings and your finals and your midterms, when I judge your output, I'm not going to be very nice for people who are not answering the questions because they didn't do the work. Do I have to tell you that? Do you know that? You're how many years old? 20 something years old? 15 years in school? And you haven't heard the idea that you have to do your homework? What is that? I feel like I'm talking to four year olds. All right, end a lecture on doing homework. Hayek. Back to Hayek. So the people that did read Hayek, the, how many of you, raise your hand if you read Hayek again. Shy, shy reader. All right. I'm going to ask you a question. What did he talk about in this paper of 12 pages, half an hour of your lifetime? What did he talk about in terms of the mechanism that you can use to coordinate people, the, the way that you would use knowledge in society? What was his big idea? Sorry? Law? No, it wasn't the law. What, do you, what did he talk about as the mechanism for helping people share knowledge in society? The what? The benefit, the benefit they can get a, co a cost benefit. No, that wasn't it either. I'm getting some more eager hands here. 
No, no, I got to get someone else here. Did you guys read it? No? All right. So guys with the hands up, what, is, what's the, what do you say? Price, the price mechanism, right? The price mechanism. The price mechanism is what coordinates people's activities across society. And for those of you who didn't read it and those of you who did read it, I'm going to read you something. Our theoretical habits of approaching the problem, but I fear a little, 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 little. Okay. Let me just, let me back up a second. He says, he quotes somebody else who's also dead. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. If you look at your phone and you say, you know, uh, call somebody, you don't know how it works. You just push a button and stuff happens, right? The internet, if anybody here is a programmer, you know there's all the kinds of code, but there's code on top of code on top of code, right? All these things are automated. You get in a car, you turn the key, don't know what's going on, push the gas, it goes forward. You have no idea, most of you. I, I know theory, theoretically, but I, you know, I can walk, I know how to do that, but the car stuff is very complicated. Civilization advances by removing things for us to think about. Right? Doesn't mean you have to stop thinking in class, by the way. This is Civilization 101, learning how to think. But he talks about removing things that you, so you don't have to think about them. As an example of that, think about how the price mechanism works. How does a price signal work to you? Give me an example. That's a very good example. If something's expensive, I don't buy it. But it's more expensive than what you want to pay, right? So did you buy this thing, this cup here? Was it worth buying? So it wasn't more expensive than you thought, right? If that was $200, would that be too much? OK. But it wasn't. So that says, OK, that's a price I'll pay. And then when she pays whatever the hell it is, 8 bucks for a cup, what happens? What does that $8 do? What does the eight dollars do with the cup? I'm going to ask you right here. I'm going to point it at you. What is, when she buys the cup, what happens with the eight dollars? What is the dynamic in the marketplace that's happening with the eight dollars? Um, material. That's a good word. Put some more verbs around it. What happens with the material? Do you have any other ideas on that? Yeah, cup, company. cup company, good. They get paid $8. And then what happens? Yeah, Advertisement? Yeah. No, they just sold the cup. I, I think it's it might be Starbucks. What's going on with the cup company? The cup company will do what? What? Right. So she changes eight dollars for the cup, yeah. right? And the cup company gets the eight dollars. What does it tell the cup company? What does the eight dollars tell the cup company? It's revenue. What does the revenue tell the cup company? Hold on. Did you say revenue? OK, tell me more about revenue. There's some cost and profit and revenue, yeah. The $8. We use the word price signal like a traffic signal, right? When you sell cups, do you get a, and you're the company. If you're the company, okay, I want to say that I want you guys to reply. OK, this is. Call and call and respond. If a company sells a cup, is that a red light or a green light? Yes. Okay, we sold a cup. And we sold this cup, we didn't sell the other cup. So maybe we should go get more of these cups. Maybe we should make more of these cups. And if the company says, I'm going to make more of the cups, what do they need to do to make more of the cups? What do they do? Sorry. Almost. That's, a, that's one answer. If, they're, if the demand is running ahead of supply, they might raise the price. But the company says, okay, I'm, I'm selling more cups. What are they going to do? Sell 
What happens next? They produce more. And how do they produce more? No, not investing. They have all the machines. They have a building. What are they doing with the, when they're producing more? What do you need to produce a cup like this? Sorry, you'll get it back. Okay. I won't drop it. Labor, good. What else do you need to produce a cup like this? Material, aluminum type material. I'm going to throw that around. Okay. And now, aluminum type material order goes out the factory to the aluminum type producing facility that you own. Right? What happened? What do you do? Your company. What does your company do that produces aluminum? Not necessarily raise the price. Everybody likes raising the price. That's very good. I could see some monopolists here in training. My job is raising price. What's your job? No, you have a company and they want more of your aluminum and you're happy to sell aluminum. Yes? And then what do you do? You have a contract. What do you do in terms of getting more aluminum? You're an aluminum company. Where do you get it? Huh? You hire more labor. This is good. Does anybody know how aluminum works? Aluminum is a refined metal. It's an element that is dug out of the ground by big machines and little people, right? So she's getting more aluminum. And who are you who's going to help her out? What's your job? I'm, you're, you're the, you're, so we're going down the supply chain, right? You go from the Starbucks, you go from the cup, she goes in the Starbucks, goes to the, the, the distributor, it goes to the manufacturer, it goes to the aluminum plant, and you are more of a resource-based company than she is, and she's more of a resource-based company than Starbucks is, so what are you doing? Good. Mining. And you are the government of whatever, Iceland, which produces uh, aluminum, by the way, strangely enough. And he says, I need to bring more materials through your facility. What do you do? Start taxing things. <laughs> There's money to be made somewhere in here. <laughs> well, yes, the, the government of Iceland is, or, the, or the country of Iceland is going to have more business, right, at the refinery, right? The, the ore actually doesn't come. This is, this is something that's interesting. The ore doesn't come. Iceland doesn't have aluminum ore. Bauxite, I believe, is the name of it, right? Bauxite comes from lots of countries, but not necessarily Iceland. Iceland, what they have, what does Iceland have? That, for example, Canada kind of has, and maybe uh, a bauxite producing country, I don't know, uh, say, uh, I don't know which is a bauxite producing country. Let's say uh, Norway, no, bad example. Let's say Spain, I don't know. Spain, what does Norway, uh, uh, Iceland have that Spain doesn't have as far as aluminum refining is concerned? This is maybe science, it's beyond your ken. Does anybody know anything about Iceland? This is a very good answer, geothermal power. In fact, cheap power. And aluminum requires a lot of power, electricity to make aluminum from bauxite. So the, the government or the country of Iceland is very happy because the uh, aluminum company is going to do some more business. And more business means that in some ways, now you guys kept saying raise prices, raise prices. Yes, there is a price thing going on here, right? What I'm trying to get at is that the so-called, uh, when she buys a cup, it has an impact through the supply chain all the way back to a refinery in Iceland, which is buying ore from Spain, which I just made up, sorry, I don't know where alumina or bauxite comes from. And there are some guy at the mine who, and his, his boss says, you have to work another 12 seconds today because some girl bought a cup in, 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 in Vancouver. Is that true? True or false? True? False. All right, you can call it out, you can wake up, it's okay. Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hands, you in the back with the blue jacket, is that true or false? 
Why is it false? The 12, the 12 seconds because the girl's buying the cup in Vancouver. Why is it false? You don't know. That's, that's okay. Why is it false? What? Not the right answer, but interesting. Why? Don't know. Okay, you guys with the hands here. What is the why? Right. It's a little faint. Right? This is what Hayek was getting at in the paper. What he's getting at is that we don't even know necessarily why we're working 12 seconds longer, right? So the 12 seconds longer, the guy's like, yeah, work 12 seconds longer. You're like, whatever, I'm making overtime, right? And he doesn't need to know that it's a cup or it's a Christmas tr aluminum Christmas tree or that it's wiring for some condominium in Florida. He doesn't care because he's getting paid a wage. The aluminum company doesn't care. They're just filling up orders. The government of Iceland is just collecting taxes. The company that's selling the cups doesn't necessarily care that she wants to buy a cup because it's her, her birthday or because someone bought it for her or whatever, right? In fact, the price system means you really don't care, but you have a reason to do something different than what you're doing. You have a reason to do something different because you're going to make some money, right? As Adam Smith said, and I think I, I don't even I already said this, but like as Adam Smith said, the butcher and the baker don't get up in the morning because they love you, right? They get up in the morning because they want to sell some meat and they want to sell some bread and you've got money. If you don't have money, they, go, they stay in bed, right? The price system allows millions, not even millions, billions of people. There's over 7 billion people on the planet. Most of them are connected through only one mechanism. It's not text messaging. It's not Facebook, right? It's the price system. And it allows, the price system allows humans to coordinate, and, and, and Hayek calls it a miracle, and he has cause. Now, one thing that's interesting is that, especially for those of you with some Chinese background, is that some countries didn't run with the price mechanism that often as an ideology of communism, for example, or a command and control economy. Other countries have a difficult relationship with the price mechanism, which is most countries, right? Some people don't, politicians, they don't trust the price mechanism. They think they can do a better job, for example, right? But what happened under communism when the price mechanism was not being used? What was, I mean, there's lots of things that happened under communism, but what was one of the bigger problems? And if you don't want to talk about China, talk about Russia or the USSR or North Korea very communist country, right? Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, Ethiopia for a while. What happened? I'm asking you, what happened? What happened in a place like China when there was communism and there was not a price mechanism being used for what? Don't know. Who studied history of economy in China. In fact, who, no one, none of you were alive probably in the early 80s during Mao. What happened in China, in the economic history of China in the last few decades? Oversupply? Not exactly. What else happened? Yeah. A lack of supply of rice. Why was there a lack of supply of rice? The drought. Not exactly. There was a household accountability system, responsibility system, was the English translation. What is that in Chinese? Have you guys heard of this? I, I just want to get this phrase. Have you heard of this thing called a household accountability system or responsibility system? Yes? What is it in Chinese? What's the name for it? You've got plenty of seconds. Does that sing, sound familiar? You guys are so post-Mao. You're like post-Mao and pre-Facebook. All right, so this system, 
what, it ha what happened is a reform, I, I, I hate to, I'm going to try and give you my own version of your history, sorry, right? But what happened as a result of this reform is that people in the countryside were given the profits from their production. Before the 1980s, more or less, if you were producing rice or something like that, the government would say, we will buy all of your rice and we will decide the price. The Canadians had a version of this. What's it called? As far as a commodity that goes in a thing that we eat all the time. The wheat board, right? The wheat board, if you, if you grew wheat as a farmer in Canada, you have to sell it to the wheat board, right? The same thing is true in, in California with the... the, the uh, apricot or the plum board or whatever, they have, to, they have all kinds of versions of this, right? But what was going on is that the farmers essentially were not keeping the, the profits of their labor. They didn't own their land and they couldn't keep the profit of their labor. So the farmers were like, who cares? I'm going to grow enough rice and veg and pigs to feed my family, maybe my cousins, and then I'm done. But when the government changed after, after Mao with Deng, they changed and said, you can supply a certain minimum amount to the government, the rest you get to keep. And bang, that's when everything started happening. That's why 99% of Chinese who have ever been outside of China are outside of China right now. It's productivity and money and wealth, right? Because those profits are what made it possible for an entire uh, generation to get wealthier. That was the start of it all. Right? In the Soviet Union, same problem. The government said, oh, these small people with only a couple hectares of land, we should make them into big collectives, and then uh, there will be several thousand, five thousand hectare, and they'll all live together in a village, and they'll all work together to pr produce collectively, and we'll all divide the profits evenly. Because we're communists, right? And then, once we're all mechanized, because we have tractors and diesel and so on, and we're selling all the potatoes from Ukraine to, up to Russia, or, the, or the, the, the wine from Georgia is going to go over to Azerbaijan, whatever the hell it was, the government was coordinating all these things, and the workers on the farm said, wait a second, if I don't work, I get paid. Well, I don't think I'm, I think I'm sick today, right? And so... They didn't produce very much. They got paid their dividend. The people in the cities, though, were not getting any food, so then the government sends soldiers into the countryside and starts pointing guns at people and saying, you better start farming food or we'll shoot you. And they did shoot a lot of people. In the 1930s, they killed millions uh, of, of farmers who resisted collectivization. But then, by the time the Soviet Union fell apart, the thing that was interesting is that I believe one-third of the food in the Soviet Union was being grown on 1% of the land. 1% of the farmed land, right? 99% of the farmed land was producing two-thirds of the food. Why was that? Somebody give me a guess. Think about household responsibility system. Like, use your imagination. Why was that? Not enough people, no. The Soviet Union had 250 million people. Why was that? The system is not reasonable. That's a good philosophical statement, but why was 1% of the land producing one-third of the food, or one-half of the food? It was a lot, actually. Why was it so hugely productive? What about this, one, this piece of land was so hugely productive that all the other pieces of land, all, this is 1% right here. Why is this 1% productive and all those other seats not productive? Guess. Uh, government is giving more money to the 1% of land. No, the government was broke. Could it be the environment? No, this was not beautiful land. Just like this land over here. In fact, it was just like this land over here. Why was this land so magically productive? <laughs> the regulation had done quite a bit to reduce productivity. Why was this land more productive? You right there. Yes. 
This was private land. The only land that you got to farm for your own self was the little bit that was around your house. So the little bit around the house became <laughs> the most productive land ever seen, right? They had pigs and chickens and broccoli and everything. Everything was piled in that little piece of land. And they would, why would they even go to work? They would call in sick. They would get their salary anyway. This is how you eat, right? And what they, what had, what, what the irony, of course, was that the Soviet Union destroyed a massively productive agricultural sector to, to make them more efficient. And then they found out how to be efficient because they didn't want to starve, right? China had its own problem with starvation in the late 1950s. Korea has its own problem with starvation, right? There's an expression from a very famous economist in England. He's Indian descent. And he says, no one ever starves in a democracy. Wisdom. And the reason is, to get back to Hayek, is because in a democracy, or rather in a free market, because some of these democracies are a little shaky, in a free market, people can work based on a price signal. They can get rewarded based on their productivity, right? And things get reallocated. When people are starving, they're willing to pay a lot of money, right? And starving people with a lot of money should be fed, but the only thing that will stop them from getting fed, essentially, is the government. Right? Because money will motivate a whole bunch of people. They'll motivate black markets, they'll motivate smugglers, they'll motivate airplanes, all kinds of things. But if the government says, I'll shoot you if you sell to that person, then you don't have a market. Right? That is the power of the price. All right, so we'll talk more about that on the midterm. Um, let's get into... Let me see, let me, sorry, I wrote another comment here. That was a long little Hayek speech, but God damn it. If you guys don't know this as an economist, like you're not even an economist. Just stop, okay? Go do chemistry or mathematics or something. If you don't understand how incentives work and prices work, then you're not even doing economics. I'm, I'm, this, is like, this is why this paper is cited by 20,000 other papers in economics. It is fundamental to the discussion of economics and economic systems. So, what's the lesson from this paper? I wrote this down, so I'll tell it to you right now. There's two things that you should take out of this paper, after you read it, of course. Be humble about what you, know, th you think you know. I don't know what you know. I don't know what you know. I don't know why your hair is colored that way. I don't know why you have one button unbuttoned. I don't need to know, necessarily, but you do know. Right? And maybe it's relevant, maybe it's not. But I might not even know what's, what's going on. So the whole point is, be humble what you know. And that, what that means is that you have to rely on other people and what they know. Right? That is how massive systems end up working. I was going to say massive multiplayer online games. But that's the same thing. Right? Massive multiplayer games, like... So-and-so is going off to do something else. Like, what's that guy doing? I don't know. And then, like, shows up later on. Oh, I killed a dragon or whatever. I shot some dude in the space cam or whatever they do on those things, right? One of the biggest uh, online games in the world is actually run out of Iceland. What's it called? The space one? Those guys got nothing to do for, like, half the year. So they're indoors making games. But they have created a universe that has hundreds of thousands of people online at any given time, all like doing stuff with each other. And is that a miracle? Not really compared to the seven billion people that are outside the game world doing crazy stuff, right? And if you think you're impressed with what you do or someone next to you is doing, then just think of all the other people out there and all the stuff that's going on in their head and how they do things. Okay, that's Hayek right now. So. What I did last, in the last uh, four ta uh, uh, sessions is I went over the basics of economics as a review and some news. There was some news for some of you. Most of it was review, hopefully. And I want to go into some more stuff here about economics that's going to matter more and more as we get into political economy as well as resources. The first thing that we need to talk about that you need to know is what I, uh, I'm going to read from here from Hayek as far as today. Of course, these adjustments are probably never perfect in the sense 
in which the economist conceives of them in his equilibrium analysis. Remember equilibrium, supply and demand, it crosses, they're all uh, efficient. This is why I had to steal chalk today. Let's talk about the price mechanism. There's no price mechanism for chalk, so we steal it from each other. Okay. So, what is P star Q star for coffee in Canada? Huh? Two dollars? What's Q star? 30 million Canadians, one cup of coffee a day, 17 cups of coffee a day. Two dollars. Uh, who, is this coffee in here? Is that coffee? Does anybody have coffee in here? Is that coffee? How much did you pay for that? 175. Coffee? Who else drinks coffee here? What'd you pay? 225. Two bucks. Timmy's. Four bucks. I'm hearing four dollars, a dollar seventy-five. Where is this equilibrium? Where is this equilibrium people keep talking about? Right? In theory, there's an equilibrium. But in reality, there's prices all over the place just for coffee. Coffee is one of the biggest commodities of all time. Tim Hortons might have the same price across the whole country, but Starbucks is not in agreement with Tim Hortons. Right? McDonald's drive through is different than McDonald's walk-up. I don't know. There's lots of prices. There's lots of quantities. So in some ways, there isn't really an equilibrium. Have you ever gone to a place where they've uh, run out of coffee or donuts or your favorite donut, right? It's like, well, that, what kind of equilibrium is that? I'm willing to pay. I've got my two bucks. Where is that coffee? Well, now you've got just nothing going on here. There is no equilibrium. The point is, is that everyday life isn't in equilibrium, right? Why am I going on this paper? I want the other paper. Everyday life is not in equilibrium. And what he says, sorry for the long introduction, I fear our theoretical habits of approaching the problem with the assumption of more or less perfect knowledge on the part of almost everyone has made us somewhat blind to the true function of the price mechanism and led us to apply rather misleading standards in judging its efficiency. If we assume equilibrium and I say, oh, $2, obviously, right? It's a price mechanism, $2, of course. But there's this crazy miracle going on between the guy in Colombia who is picking little beans off the tree, cherries they call them, running through a machine, selling it to his distributor who takes it to uh, a wholesaler and then they're going to uh, ship the green stuff to some warehouse in Tennessee or whatever the hell it is and it ends up in your cup after all those steps, right? Oh, two dollars. Yeah, naturally. Equilibrium. No, it's not. It's a fucking miracle. Isn't it? It's crazy that this happens. Some dude in Colombia is working for your coffee. Tea drinkers, someone's working for your tea, right? The water drinkers, someone's working for your water. You don't even know each other, right? But that's what's going on. There's all these little coordinations going on, and they're amazing when they work. This is why economists say, hey, you can use the market. That's really helpful. If you have a carbon tax, as opposed to a license plate regime, why is the carbon tax, a price mechanism, going to be more effective at reducing? Why can't it be? Why should it be more effective than a license plate regime? Why? Why? You, yes. Why? Did you not hear it? Why is a price mechanism like a carbon tax more effective than a license plate regime in changing driver behavior? Because money is more what utility? Sorry? Direct? Ah, so money is a, it's a more direct what? For utility. I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense right now. Someone else will give me a new version of that. What's another version of that? Why is a price 
on gasoline? Why is a carbon tax more effective than a license plate regime at changing driver behavior? Right. That's a very good thought. The license plate's a one-time cost. You pay $10,000, now you have two cars. Right? You don't, now you don't care anymore. But every time you fill up gasoline, prices are more effective. Why else? Why else? You don't know? Do you have a car? No. Do you have a bicycle? No. Do you have an apartment? You're an international student. Do you pay anything for anything? What? Rental? Fee. Did you choose where you lived? Why did you choose to live there? Convenience. Yeah. How much is your rent? 1020 Would you live there if it was $2,000 for rent? Okay. So you're price sensitive. I understand. But if it was $2,000, you would change your behavior. Yeah? Okay. So what happens when the price changes is you can live in lots of different places. Maybe you live somewhere because your, your brother lives there or your, or your friend lives there, right? But if your friend says, hey, come with, live with me. Oh, that's great. I'd love to live with you. It's $9,000 or whatever. Well, no, that's too much. $1,900 a month. You're like, whoa, you're my friend, but let's meet for beer, right? If your friend says, I got you a deal, 300 bucks a month, because you're my bro, right? Then that's a good friend, unless it's a closet, right? That's a bad friend. So there's this difference between, the price makes you think about things, right? But let's get back to the cars. Why is the price mechanism on the gasoline, give me another example about how it can be more effective at reducing congestion around Vancouver or Beijing or Shanghai or London. Why is the price mechanism going to be more effective at reducing congestion? I'll go back to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's about $80,000, U.S. dollars. It's a lot. Right. Okay, so in Singapore, what they say is, it's so expensive to buy a car, and those licenses only last eight or ten years or something, right? Okay, so you have to buy a license to buy a car, to own a car. And there's so few licenses that there's never congestion in Singapore, relatively speaking, right? And then still the, the petrol prices are, are quite high, but there's not enough cars to even create congestion, right? So the price mechanism in Singapore is not the same as the, uh, the license plate lottery, maybe, in Beijing. And so they just make it so exp I mean, eighty thousand dollars. Is it eighty thousand Singapore or U.S.? It's very high. It's ridiculous, basically, right? It's like in, in the U.S. that'd be World War III, basically, taking away car <gasps> my car. Okay. So why? Why? So tell me. But tell me. I want a better reason why the price mechanism is more. Right. 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 Very good point. Okay, so if you have this even odd day thing, maybe you switch your schedule around, or like maybe you and your neighbor swap car, or whatever the hell it is, you, you carpool, you're still driving just as much. But if it's expensive to drive, then you don't drive very much. Right? I lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years. Gasoline costs, is it per liter? So, uh, gasoline in the Netherlands costs uh, $2.50 Canadian per liter, right? And the tra cha trains are cheaper and very, very effective because the country's tiny. The Netherlands is basically the size of greater Vancouver. It's a tiny country, right? But very few people have cars, or actually a lot of people have cars. They don't drive them very often. But there's a bunch, bunch of people who don't even, you know, don't have any cars at all because it's so expensive to drive. But when they do drive, you know, they're very careful about how many trips they take and how many places they go. And, and, and guess what? Is it more likely you're going to have one person or, or two or three people in a car when gasoline's expensive? Huh? 
Everybody, in the car, come on, right? When you go to poor countries and you get in the taxi and someone else gets in the taxi with you, who's this guy? What about the guy in the front seat? Oh, who's the other guy? You get five people in the taxi with you. Share taxis, they're very, very efficient, actually, and they end up being cheaper, right? You pay whatever it is, a dollar or something like that. I read this morning the gasoline in Venezuela, if I have this right, is, wow, one cent is eight liters. It's half a penny a gallon in Venezuela. <coughs> Venezuela happens to be the murder capital of the world right now, and their economy is in ruins, but they have cheap gas. If you want to migrate, I'm sure they'll open that opportunity up to you. So the thing is this. The price, price mechanism is a very constant pressure on you to either do, go one way or another. It, is, it creates an incentive, right? If someone puts something on sale, you're going to buy it maybe when you wouldn't have bought it before. If someone offers you a job, compared to another job, you look at the wages, right? You're going to look at other things. The commute, do you like the people, does it fit your career? But money matters, right? After school, after you finish university, everybody's going to say, you should work in, in, as an intern. Okay, how much are you going to pay me? Nothing. Okay, that's zero. I can work with zero. Is this going to pay me more so I can eat? Maybe. Is it the same field? Maybe not. So you go through those decisions. But prices send signals. And when the price of gasoline goes up, you find ways of using less. You buy a different car, you carpool, you drive uh, uh, more uh, destinations on one trip, and so on. Right? But if a license plate thing is like, ah, now that I have two license plates, I don't care. I am immune to the price mechanism. That's why it's not a long-term solution to congestion or overdriving, for example. So the problem with economics in general, economics one that you guys learned, is we have this thing called equilibrium, and it's perfect, and we know everything. We have perfect information, complete information. But the real world is not even close to being like that. The solution for the real world, which is imperfect information, asymmetric information, what's asymmetric information mean? Do you know asymmetric? They have di both parties have different amounts of information. More or less, you know more than me or I know more than you. That's asymmetric, right? Asymmetric information, uh, incomplete information. Or what about the future, which no one really knows, right? But the future has two kinds of information. One of them is called a risk, and the other one is called uncertainty. This definition is very important, so I'm going to give it to you, and I want you to make sure you write it down. It's not going to be very exact. But risk is something that we understand in terms of probabilities. If I have my loyal loony here, and I've got the queen on one side and a loony on the other, and I drop it, oops. I'm going to get heads or tails. I'm going to get the queen or the bird, right? If I flip this about 100 times, how many times am I going to get the queen? How many times am I going to get the bird? Around 50-50, right? That is risk. Risk has a probability attached to it. The insurance company that looks at your health costs, your auto insurance company, um, the weather reports are mostly based on statistical models with probability. They're based on risk, right? Uncertainty means that we don't have a probability. Or, in some cases, it's, if I asked you, do you want to take a, a bet right now? I'm going to flip this coin, and if it's heads, you get an A, and if it's tails, you get an F. Now, from a statistical perspective, what's his grade? A C. Let's see. We'll just make it a C. So you're like, wow, statistically speaking, I'm going to get a C. Is that, a, is that a, a bet that you would want to take every day? Not really. Probably because of what's called risk aversion. You pay more attention, humans in general, 90% of humans are risk averse. 
The guys that jump off the mountains for Red Bull, risk seekers, right? They die. <laughs> but they make good money, right, until they die. But risk aversion means that you put a higher weight on the, on the downside, on the loss, than you put on the upside. So this is not really, you're like, eh, it's a C. It's actually more like a D in your head. I could say, if it's, if it's heads, you pay me $100. If it's tails, I pay you $100. Now, statistically, that's worth zero on average. But if there's only one flip, that makes you a little bit nervous, right? And most people are not willing to do that for the, the zero dollar expected value. They'd rather have, for example, $10 as an expected value. 110 versus, 100, versus or sorry, 120 versus minus 100. But it turns out that uh, uh, those, those things affect the way we buy insurance, and insurance companies understand that. But insurance companies play a role. What they do is they take your individual flip, which is basically your life expectancy, right? You're dead or alive. The insurance company's like, wow, this guy, I'm not sure I want to do with this risk on his death, his death or whatever. But if you start to give me 100 people, now I start to have 100 coin flips. Now I start to know what's going to happen, right, if I'm the insurance company. And then I could say, well, given this and given that and given a girl and given a guy and so on, I will offer you an insurance policy that will average out all of these risks because I'll have a probability, a PDF, a probability distribution of what's going to happen. So what's going to happen from here is that Let's say that, um, whatever, half of you are going to end up on, on the unlucky half of the uh, normal curve, the normal distribution, and half of you are going to end up on the lucky half. Neither of us know that. You don't know it? I don't know it. But on average, it's going to work out, right? It's going to be about 50% on this side and 50% on that side. So that's how the insurance company works. That's how risk works. But the uncertainty is, what's going to happen on a single coin flip? That's one thing. You're not quite sure what's going to happen. You don't have a probability. If I, if I flip a coin, it doesn't, I don't care if you say 50-50. 50-50 doesn't mean anything. It's either heads or tails, right? More importantly, what happens when you go out on a date? First date. What's going to happen on the first date? Hmm, we're going to kiss. Who's going to buy dinner? Is it gonna, am I, I going to be on time? Is it going to work out well? If you have, what is that movie, 50 first dates or something like that? If you have 50 first dates, then half of them are going to be on this side and half are going to be on this side. But we don't get 50 chances for a first date. You get one. Who's had a bad first date? Who's had a good first date? Who's never dated in their life? Everybody else, raise your hand. Come on, what are you, like all in arranged marriages or something like that? Who's had a bad first date? One. Boy, you guys are like either in denial or optimists. Who, okay, let me ask you a different way. Who's had a, 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 who's, who has a boyfriend or girlfriend right now? Raise your hand. Okay, who doesn't? Who has never? Too much shame, actually. I'm tr what I'm trying to get at is that if you have had more than one boyfriend or girlfriend, almost by definition, you've had a bad first date because you're not with that person anymore. That was a mistake. I had a girlfriend, oh, that was a mistake, you know. Even after a couple years, it was a mistake, right? The first date was not, it should have been gone the other way. That's uncertainty. Uncertainty is you literally don't know how it's going to work out, right? The world has a lot more uncertainty than economic models will allow. Who's heard of expected utility? Expected utility depends on this, right? You have to have a probability. If you don't have a probability, you can't even do expected utility. Holy guacamole. Okay, you guys are way too patient. What is the start? It's been an hour. Okay, 10 minute break. Is, if most people are risk averse, why are people gambling? It's a good question. What's your answer? Optimistic. 
They're risk averse, but they're optimistic, which is uh, maybe it's a balancing thing. Why else? Why do people gamble if if they're usually they're risk averse? They don't think they're going to lose, but they repeatedly lose. Why do they keep going? Sorry. They can't control their cost spending, so it's a kind of addiction. Why else? They'll lose a little bit of money, but they hope to gain a lot of money. In the lottery? Right. Lottery is one way to look at that. No, it's not. So don't get in a car accident. No, no. So it's, it's fun. Some people, like, they have these penny slots. You put it in pennies. It takes so long to lose money that you die of old age. This is why old people were there. Like, nothing to do. Right? There's a thrill. Right? So... The reason all the machines are all blinking and lighting because it's like it's to stimulate you and say, oh, I'm doing all this, making the machines light up and so on. So there is an entertainment value. There is the eternal optimist who always thinks, oh, yeah, just one more time. There's an addiction there. There's, uh, you know, people can't control themselves. It's an addiction. It's a very big problem. Uh, it's ironic, I think. The only thing more ironic than most governments controlling the lottery and gambling, which more or less takes money from poorer people, right? The, the people who, 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 who spend a bigger share of their income on gambling are poorer people. So the government is taking money from poorer people. The only thing more ironic than that is the government of China running the cigarette monopoly. Right? Smoke, 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 die. Right? And the government gets all the money from selling you cigarettes. And if you die, they don't have to worry about taking care of you because you're dead. Right? Lung cancer is great for health care costs. But there's no big difference with the, with the running the lottery or the government selling you drugs, basically. They don't care about you as much as your money, right? So this is a big irony. I think what's going on, I mean, there's people who are risk-seeking in gambling, uh, but the psychology mostly is, is that people... Huh? Reinforcement of what? Right, okay, so there's this kind of like, I'm losing, I'm losing, I'm losing, oh, surprise, I'm a winner, right? It's kind of nice, it is a pleasant surprise, I can see that. Um, but very few uh, economists play the lottery, last I checked, right? Cause it's, or statisticians for that matter, because it's stacked against you. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't, uh, you know, I think a lot of economists actually like playing card games because they're all trying to fool each other, right? So speaking of card games, which reminds me of game theory, which is what I wanted to talk about, Game theory is this world here. Let me, let me actually keep this illustration going. Um, I'm just going to put it like this. This is risk. And this is uncertainty. You literally don't know what's going to happen. This is game theory. That's based on a known amount of information. We have uh, uh, reaction functions and payoff functions, and uh, we know the number of players, we know the number of moves, and so on. And this is what's called um, conflict theory. What happens in conflict? There's an expression, all's fair in love and war. What does all's fair in love and war mean? What does all's fair mean? Anything goes. There literally are no rules. Right? If, if you're having a war and someone says, uh, and, you, and you come up on the enemy and the enemy's like, oh my God, I'm eating lunch. Please don't uh, bother me while I'm eating lunch. You know, be polite. And it's like, no, I'm just going to shoot you. Right? There are no rules. There is no uh, chivalry and so on. Conflict theory is, I, get a, I, I do what I can get away with. It is the, the rules of, of nature in a sense, right? If, if, if you're a, a snake coming along and there's a mouse and the mouse is eating lunch, you don't sit there and wait for the mouse to finish lunch before you eat, this, you eat the mouse, right? And it turns out that a lot of human behavior is modeled by economists in this world 
when it actually belongs over here. I just read an interesting article about uh, a Russian oligarch, uh, actually Ukrainian oligarch. The oligarchs are the, the super rich of the ex-Soviet Union who basically made a lot of money when the Soviet Union was falling apart, often by grabbing oil companies and metal companies and other resource companies. They found different ways of doing that. They had political friends. They were more or less mafia, right? Most developing countries have their own form of mafia. And these don't people, they, they might talk about honor. The whole word mafia comes from Italian. And Italians always talk about honor. But that's honor among each other. Other people, they kill. Right? Oh, I'm going to take all of your stuff and your wife and your house and so on. And I'll kill you. And that's how they roll. Right? They don't do game theory. They don't do rules. And conflict theory is, is important to keep in mind if you're talking about a situation. You say, are we in the rules or are we outside the rules? If we're in the rules, what are the rules that are relevant? And should we change any of them? If we're outside the rules and we're talking about international climate change treaties and there are no rules, how do we make a treaty? Right? How does the Maldives negotiate with China about climate change? when Maldives has an average altitude of about one meter above sea level. And the drivers in Beijing are going around in circles, right? And the drivers in America are all going around in circles. They love that, right? If there's one thing the Americans have exported to China, it's driving cars. So, this stuff is important when it comes to reality and managing resources, right? This, the, the, one of the examples from this oligarch, he, was, he owned part of a, a company. You know, he owned a company and he wanted to take over another company. And he went to a judge and paid a bribe. And the judge said the other company was now bankrupt. It's out of business. And this guy's company, because it was owed some money by the first company, like $50,000 literally, he took it over and he paid uh, roughly uh, $10 million to get a company that was worth $80 million. That's a good deal, right? It was also totally illegal and crooked, but in Russia, there's no rules when you can bribe the judge, right? That's what it means, rule of law, it means you don't bribe the judge. But if you can bribe the judge, then wow, great, I can just take over a company. On the other hand, someone might shoot me in the street, right? So it's not exactly sure which is the right way to go. It turns out to be true that a whole bunch of these Russian billionaires are, uh, they love the idea of living in England because now they can have, live in a country where there is laws, where there are laws, right? And that's why there was a big departure from Hong Kong to Vancouver in the late 90s because a lot of people in Hong Kong who were used to the English system were worried about the Chinese administration coming into Hong Kong, which is still a worry for some people, right? But when you get money, as soon as you get money, then you want to start defending it, don't you? Every, every thief becomes a law-abiding citizen as soon as he has a million bucks in the bank. So that's what happens in terms of the person wanting to move from here to here, but many, many resources around the world are in this area. Oil is this, in this area, minerals, diamonds, gold, they're managed, so to speak, in this area, which means if you can get it, it's yours. And there is no game theory, there's no strategy. Someone will come up and maybe just shoot you, right? I'm only telling you this because when we get into the discussion of the various things, fisheries is, fisheries is over here like crazy, right? The amount of illegal, illegal, what's not legal? There's no law. The law is to be not whatever, what you can get and you can, you can keep. So a lot of resources are managed over here, which is another reason why we have a lot of problems with resources, or the environment for that matter, right? It's not, and someone says, oh, I'll do game theory. It's like, yeah, nice try. I actually did a, a thing, uh, ran, I ran an experiment a couple years ago at UC Berkeley with a bunch of climate change negotiators. They're all game theorists. I said, okay, half of you, this is actually a, a useful example, half of you, no, a third of you are from the US. A third of you are from China. And a third of you are the, the judges, so to speak. And I want you, the US and China, to negotiate a climate change treaty, but there's no rules. 
The only rule is that you have to agree. And if you don't agree, I will allow the judges to choose a winner. So what did the Chinese side want in terms of climate change? What's a prediction? Anybody here paid attention to climate change debates? Anybody here from China? Yes? What did the Chinese propose to the Americans? To the China wanted to continue to develop. And what would they, so they, that would increase their carbon emissions. What did they want from the Americans as a way of decreasing their carbon emissions? What did they ask? What did they ask? Technology. Yes. What else did they ask? Money. Money is very useful. Money and technology to let us continue to develop in a green pathway. Right? What do the Americans want? Let's, let's pretend they're Canadians. What do the Americans want or the Canadians want? What's the quid pro quo? Uh, we're giving you money, technology, you're developing. What do we want from you? What? Reduce well, reduced emissions was part of what China was offering in exchange for all the, all the compensation. What else? Were the Americans going to reduce their emissions? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. What would, what would America offer? Think like, think what would Canada offer? Like, try to put your head into Canada. Just go to Tim Hortons, whatever. <laughs> We're done. The American side wanted, believe it or not, access to Chinese markets which doesn't have a lot to do with climate change, last I checked, but that was what their side wanted. Now, the thing that was interesting about this negotiation is they actually never reached an agreement because one side wanted too much and the other, you know, the Chinese side's like, oh, technology, how much technology? Well, just give us, you know, uh, uh, an aircraft carrier or, uh, you know, a trillion dollars. Well, like some price, there's always a price. The like negotiation is a question. The Americans want, oh, we want access. Yeah, we want to run all the coal mining in China. No, it's not going to happen. So they didn't reach an agreement, and we had to go to the judges, and the judges were like, okay, how are we going to decide? And uh, the judges said to the Chinese and the American sides, what are you going to offer us? So now you have, we're, we're not over here, we're over here, right? What are you going to offer us? And they, they basically, the, they, the, the judges decided to, 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 to uh, uh, accept the American position that the world was going to follow the American uh, proposal because America offered them $10 trillion of bribes, right? A quantified large amount of money, and the Chinese side was like, $10 trillion? Too much. So America won. They won the biggest bribe competition, right? Now, the problem, of course, with bribes is once I pay you a bribe, now what's the problem? Huh? It's not unfair, you just got $10 trillion. What's the problem with bribes in general? Almost, that's a competition. Right, no, so think about it. If, I, if, I, if you give me a bribe and I'm like, oh, here, give me 100 bucks, I'll give you an A. Now I've got 100 bucks. I don't need to give him an A. Sorry? Performance? Promise performance. You have to execute, right? You have to deliver, right? That's why the mafia has such a huge reputation for being men of honor. If we, this is an expression, if you bribe us, we stay bribed, right? That's the way it works. You have to be like be a good business person in terms of bribery, right? So anyway, that's conflict theory. It is a self-policing thing. Okay. Um, The other part of, of this whole discussion uh, is what's called, uh, well, it's, it's not even worth talking about, so I won't even talk about it. Um, okay, let me change the subject here for a little bit. Another part where economics uh, has issues in terms of things that we know, things we can measure, and things that we don't know, things we don't measure, is GDP. And I'm just going to say this because this class is very concerned with it. 
Okay, so if GDP is on this side of the line for things we know, quantify, math, etc., unknown, subjective, or uh, Math. Uh, I was just going to put a. I'm going to put feeling in here, which is a very strange word for an economics thing, but it's like it's kind of the opposite of a mathematical certainty. What is it about? What is the? What is the? If there, if I'm going to talk about GDP, what is the definition of GDP? Guy in the back. What does it mean? I'm sorry. Yes, I believe, gross domestic product, right? There's a thing called gross national product, which includes exports, but there's this definition. Gross domestic product, it's the output of goods and services within a country. Okay. What happens if I go to the, the hair salon and I get the barber guy to cut my hair? Does GDP go up or down? Okay, what happens if my girlfriend cuts my hair at home? Up or down? No change, potentially down from an opportunity cost. She could be out there earning money, but really no change, right? What happens if I uh, buy some bullets? Can you buy bullets in Canada? You have Walmart? <laughs> what happens if I take my car and I uh, drive it off of a cliff? Does GDP go up or down? Nowhere. GDP is the flow, right? I have destroyed the stock. I'm not dead, by the way. I just drove it off, right? But I destroy my car. But then, oh my God, crazy. Someone says, you've got this crazy insurance policy that will rebuild your worthless car, right? And we'll spend $15,000 rebuilding the car you just wrecked. GDP goes up or down? Up. So if you destroy cars, GDP goes up. Hmm. If I break windows and people repair the windows, GDP goes up or down? Okay. If I chop down a tree that a friendly little bird is living in and I turn it into firewood and I sell it to campers, does GDP go up or down? And so on, right? GDP goes up for some strange reasons. It goes up for some good reasons, right? We, we, you know, we go to the market, we buy an apple, the apple guy makes some money, we, make some, we, we eat an apple, and so on. But GDP can go up for very strange reasons, right? And if it goes up for, and sometimes it'll go up on the visible side, but on the invisible side, it's going down. This is the most important thing to keep in mind in terms of this class. If I turn trees, from an environmental good, which is a forest, into a material good, which is lumber or, or firewood, then I am, on the one hand, doing something over here that's not measured, and over here, I'm doing something good, right? I've got labor, I've got capital, I've got lumber, I've got sales, and so on, right? So all this stuff is showing up here in GDP, and if a government thinks that GDP is a good idea, and politicians get reelected because they say, I increased GDP by 2.4% last year, or in China, where the government policy is right now 7 or 8%, what is it? Do you anybody know? It's about 7 or 8%. Where literally, if you don't hit your numbers, you will lose your power because the party will move you out and put someone else in, right? If your numbers are lumber, then you don't care about trees. If your lumbers are shipping steel and coal and cars and buildings, you don't care about rivers and lakes and air quality and endangered species and so on. Because this is not measured in GDP. There's an article that came out recently by a guy who's uh, been talking about this a, a while, about moving beyond GDP. Right? It's a good idea. It's a good article. I, I have it on the, uh, I'm putting it on the blog, I think, later this week. But the idea is, if we're only pursuing this number, 
then maybe we're pursuing the wrong actions. Maybe we're permitting the wrong actions. Maybe we're cutting down too many trees compared to the benefit that we're getting because the cost benefit is not actually accounting for things correctly. We're not including everything in the costs and benefits, right? So GDP can be visible, but the invisible part can be quite uh, dangerous and, 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 and bad for the country. That's a, a major point of this class. It will come up again and again and again. OK. Um, another part of this, now let's move more into the resource economic stuff. Another part of this is that this is not exactly the way it works when you're talking about resources. Number one, it's not an equilibrium. But if it's not an equilibrium, what's going on? You've got lots of different transactions occurring over time. Over time. This is like a snapshot, right? This is static, is what the expression is. What we want to talk about is a dynamic world. And a dynamic world is the world we live in, right? The, the static world is essentially frozen. The, the, the printed pages on your book are static. The conversations we have or the airflow in the room or all that things that goes on in life, that's more dynamic. And we're talking about dynamics. You're talking about T for time over here, right? And maybe you've got quantity here. Quantity is up there and T is on the... On the uh, y-axis, the horizontal axis. No, the horizontal axis, not the y-axis. Is this the y or the x? This is the x? I can't, I can't remember this shit. Okay, so what you have over time, for example, might be something like, uh, say this. And what is this? This could be the number of students in the classroom. At the start of the hour, there's a few, and then it peaks out, and then it goes down, and the classroom empties. That could be one kind of dynamic. Or maybe you've got um, a dynamic like this, which could be the, the who's, who's take, who knows, what, who can describe this, what that refers to? If you've taken a science class, I think it's called a sinusoidal curve, but what does that refer to in terms of dynamics? Who's taken a biology class ever? <laughs> Raise your hand. Ever? Ever? Okay, biology guys. Come on. Who's heard of biology? <laughs> What's going on here? What, is this, what does this describe? This is a system. It's a population growth curve, right? It's a system in which the population is increasing it's increasing at an increasing rate, it hits an inflection point, it's increasing at a decreasing rate, and it kind of levels off. This level here is called the carrying capacity, right? Or it's, or it's satur saturated, or it's uh, satiated, whatever you want to call it. The population isn't going any, it's just kind of leveling off. because There's just not enough uh, resources, for example, to feed productivity. This tends to describe how lots of fisheries work, for example. The fishery will expand, 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 and then there'll be like not enough food around to eat, and so the fish actually kind of slow down. There's this whole thing with like, a if you put a fish in a little fish tank, it'll be like this big. In a big fish tank, it'll be bigger. And you put it in the wild, it'll be big. The fish regulate their size based on the resources available, right? Humans, totally unlike that. Humans, like, we occupy every ecological niche. We're going to take over Mars, etc. We have to restrain ourselves which is one of the reasons we have some problems these days with this, the environment. So resources, they go on these growth curves. They have all kinds of growth curves. Maybe there's so many fish, they eat all the food, and then there's a crash, right? There's a population crash. But what this dynamic thing does is it tells you, oh, over time, uh, the population will change. The quantity will change. This is very important in terms of managing resources. And the easiest way to talk about this
is more or less what economists will call a two-period game. So we have x, um, which I'm going to call the, the total uh, outcome, a total production, let's say, is, is equal to the sum of uh, x1 plus x2, where 1 and 2 actually refer to two different goods or what? What does it refer to when we're talking about, huh? Periods, right? Period 1 and period 2. Time. So the total production is going to be what we take in period one versus what we take in period two, right? Remember we did the fishing game with the candy? Now what happened in the fishing game? Did, we, did all the candy get eaten? Yeah? So we didn't have any of this in that candy game, right? So that was our total production, was just what was period one. But had we waited, we would have had x1 and x2, but we would have had uh, a delta here, which I'm going to call it delta. I'm going to call that a discount factor. Uh, what's the relationship between a discount factor and a discount rate? 1 minus r is equal to delta, okay? Discount rate is R. What, is this, what does a discount rate mean? What, which price? Almost. The discount rate helps you make a relationship between the future value and the present value, right? You guys took a class where you talk about discount rates? What's the most common discount rate that's mentioned? What's it based on, not the number? Interest rate, right? The interest rate. The real interest rate, right? Not the inflation rate. So the discount rate can be based on the real interest rate. Let's say that's 3%. So 1 minus 3 is 0 0.97. 0 0.97 in front of x2 is how you discount x that is harvested in year 2 or period 2 or whatever you want to call it, right? What does this mean is that you're looking at a trade-off between taking something now and taking something later, right? We talked before about supply curves and the idea of the supply curve sloping up is that the cost of supplying more is going to rise. So if you are producing this much here, you have this cost here. If you want to produce twice as much in terms of quantity, you're over here and the, and the, and the marginal cost is double or triple, right? So as a producer, with a factory and some workers and a coal mine or a, any other type of supply chain, as a producer you're going to say, well, I can produce this much this period and next period I can produce the same again at a reasonable cost. Or I can produce a whole bunch right now at a much higher cost, right? So what you're doing as a producer is you're thinking, how much do I want to produce now? How much do I want to produce later? You're making a dynamic decision, right? And usually you're willing to wait to produce it in the next period unless, of course, there's some kind of crazy price reason why you should be producing it right now. This is one of those questions, you know, is Alberta trying to get all the oil out of the ground before the price of oil crashes kind of questions. If the oil price is going to... If you could tell the government of Alberta that the oil price was going to be stable for the next 100 years at a, a real equivalent of $100 a barrel, they should slow down. They should say, let's take the oil out of the ground in a, a reasonable, cheapest possible way to maximize our profits. But for some reason, they're in a real hurry to get it out of the ground, which might be because they think the oil price is going to crash, or the administration will change, or there's going to be a carbon tax, or the environmental regulations will be applied, 
which mostly it isn't. I was having a conversation that there's an election coming up, right, in 2015 apparently. This is going to be interesting for the, the oil companies be very interested in the election, as will the pipeline companies. But you'll talk about that when we get to the briefing. So what you have here with these dynamics is a discount rate to try and keep track of what's going on. What was the discount rate in the fishing game? Or the discount factor? What was the discount factor in the fishing game when we played it here? It was a zero was a discount factor. De facto, the weight was zero on second period consumption. Not exactly true, of course, because it was zero if I, for me, if I waited because maybe you'll take my fish. So that became the zero. The zero was not because I didn't care about the second period. The zero was because someone else will steal my fish if I wait, right? So the, the first person who walked in there with a zero forced everybody around the fishing area to have a zero also. Because anybody who waited lost their fish, right? So discount factors are not just to help you with the dynamics of one period and another period, but they also are reflecting the dynamics of the people around you. Who's heard of a social discount rate? You've heard of it. A social discount rate is reflecting costs and benefits, let's say, that are not included in the model, that are over here. The social discount rate includes things like uh, the environment in the future. What's the social discount rate? If the, if the, if the, the discount rate is 5% or so, what would, the, what would the social discount rate be? Don't know? Would it be higher or lower? I don't have to, don't give me a number. Higher or lower? Higher. The social discount rate would be higher. That's correct. It would be higher if you're going to put, sorry, if you're going to put more weight on the future because the future matters to society, so to speak, right? It's, it's the, if, if people today are myopic about the future, if they only care about, well, I'm going to get out of class and I'm going to get some lunch and I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive as fast as possible and who cares about the atmosphere or whatever, I'm going to be dead anyway. That's one way of having a, a low discount rate. But if you worry about yourself personally, for the 50 to 80 years of life you have left, that will increase your, uh, it'll, it'll lower your, dis sorry, I said that wrong actually. The, the discount rate actually, you gave the wrong answer, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> the social discount rate is actually lower because lower makes you more patient about the future. It puts a higher weight on the future. When the discount rate is 100, and the discount factor is zero, you don't care about tomorrow. If the discount factor is, is 0.99, you put a pretty high weight on tomorrow. If it's 0.95 or 0.90, you put less of a weight on tomorrow, right? So the, the, the more patient you are, the lower is your discount rate, the higher is your discount factor. I'm, I'm sorry to use both of these words, but they, they are interchangeable. So if you're more patient about tomorrow, this delta is closer to 1, and that means that you're going to uh, be, uh, you know, you won't necessarily incur a lot of, uh, do a lot of benefits today uh, that are going to have costs tomorrow, right? You're not going to drive your car as much today because you worry about the climate change or the smog tomorrow. That's kind of the reasoning behind that. And it puts a, it puts a higher weight on the future, on the so-called children, on the, the seven generations down the hill. Right? So the debates over climate change have often been really debates about the discount rate, which is amazing, if you think about it. If we could all agree on the discount rate, in a sense, then we would all be willing to act on climate change because we would have a big weight on what happens in the future. There's a big debate on that among economists and, and technologists, more or less, which is, well, we can screw up the planet today because someone will, will invent a solution for the future. It's a bit optimistic because you know you can't un you can't do Jurassic Park and bring back species that are extinct or ecosystems that are gone, but that is one of the discussions around climate change. We don't have to worry about the future, we'll take care of it uh, with technology. Okay, one more thing. 
when we were talked about flipping the coin and so on, or, or risk, if I told you that I can, that, that I could flip, I could, no, if I told you you're going to have a gamble, and, uh, or I'm, I, if I told you you're going to play a card game, and it's going to be uh, poker, let's say, and I have five cards that are not showing, and you have five cards that are not showing, you would want to know what cards I have in poker, right? You want to know what cards I have. If you know what cards I have, then you can bet with more belief that you're going to win or not bet because you know you're going to lose. If I show you a card, that's information to you. You like that. You're willing to pay for that, right? If I show you two cards and three cards, you're willing to pay more and more. There is what's called an option value. There's a value to knowing more about the future. And the option value, essentially, is, is what you're willing to pay to have that option, to have that information. And when it comes down to dynamics and discounts and so on, sometimes the, 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 what we want to do is we want to know more about the possibility of the future. We invest a lot of money to find out what can happen in terms of probabilities or to do a study to get a good extrapolation, to get a good straight line or whatever. Option values help us make better... Uh, the op we, we would be willing to pay now more to know more about the future. It's valuable to us. I'm saying this in terms of the discussion of dynamics. I'm saying that in terms of discussion between this world and that world. And I'm saying that in the context of Canada, which is a, a big controversy right now, which is the government, the federal government, is funding, is cutting, cutting, and cutting funding to sciences. The science cutting of the government of Canada is actually about knowing less about the future. This is a very strange idea unless there's a, a group of people who don't want to know about the future because they prefer to concentrate on today. It turns out the oil industry likes that idea quite a bit. This is not a political statement, this is an economic statement, this is a political economy. And the one thing you, you don't want to know if you're a polluting industry is how much polluting you're putting out. Right? And that's one reason why the government is cutting science funding. So we'll leave it at that and I'll see you guys